Hi there, so we're sitting here at AERA in New York, and I have Dr. Bill Ayers and Dr. Joel Westheimer here. Of course, Dr. Bill Ayers is the author of many books, but some of them include Teaching with Conscience and uh, Demand the Impossible. Dr. Westheimer has uh, Pledging Allegiance and his newest book, What Kind of Citizen? And that's going to take us right into the first question, which is, I'd like to get you both to discuss the relationship between education, citizenship, and democracy. Big question. Big question, and you're up to it. One of the things that I always like to think about is what the differences of schools are or should be in a democratic society or a totalitarian society. Right? What special skills do citizens of a democracy need that citizens in a totalitarian society don't need. And one of the big ones, I think, is the ability to ask questions and deal in multiple perspectives. Because in a democracy, you need to be able to make decisions about how you want to live. Um, it's not something that's handed down for you. It's something that has to be determined by the people. And if the people are, are going to be making those decisions, then uh, they need to be educated in how to make those decisions, how to talk to one another, how to work out um, disagreements and, uh, and things like that. And uh, some schools do that and some less so. You and I have talked about this for so long, this question of, of a school system always um, reflecting the social system that it's yeah. embedded in. So and any school is both window and mirror of the society that it's in. And so if you went to the old South Africa, apartheid South Africa, and you looked at the schools, you could figure out what the society looked like. And if you looked at the society, you could figure out what the schools would look like. And it was very apparent. You know, the schools for European kids were small classes, state-of-the-art equipment, um, you know, beautiful buildings. And for the kids, the African kids, they'd have 50 kids in a class. and. Uh, a broken roof and no furnace, you know, I mean, so apartheid reflected itself in the schools and it's true across the board, but something important to remember about that, so you go to fascist Germany or fascist Italy, they produced brilliant athletes, musicians, artists, scientists, and they also produced the conditions where people could move the other way as other human beings were marched into the ovens. And so I think that's an important distinction because we get carried away sometimes thinking it's skills-based and so on, but obedience and conformity is the trademark of every yeah. autocratic regime. And you would hope that in a free society, initiative, courage, imagination, possibility, entrepreneurship, those would be the values that whatever else you taught, you focused on. See, this is something that I've been wanting to ask you, and you just reminded me of it, is, um, You've heard me sort of talk about this role of schools Perhaps in democratic and totalitarian yeah. societies. In fact, I don't know which of us said that first. But yeah, you know, I, I, I don't call it plagiarism. When I copy you, I call it uh, you know collaging yeah. or, or, exactly. or sampling. Sampling, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Sampling. But but I have this this question that I don't think we've talked about, and I'm curious about it. Um, Cuba, the Cuban school system, um, one of the best school systems in the world in terms of literacy, in terms of, uh, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of things, right? Um, there's certain things that are probably going to be off the table for discussion in a Cuban classroom. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, uh, yeah, how, I mean, how does that... You know, I, I don't know, I don't know enough to know, so I, yeah. I can't really dig into the, into it deeply, but I would... I would surmise that there are all kinds of limits that you and I would find objectionable. Right. The one, the closest encounter I had was I was in Venezuela during the revolutionary period there when Chavez was in charge and, and, and real reforms were coming in and remarkable literacy campaign was going on. But when I went to some of the schools, they had these, what was beautiful about, many beautiful things about that moment, but one was that education was seen as something that should happen pre-K through the lifespan. And so there were educational circles. I took a bus up to a mountaintop rural community and people were meeting at 8 o'clock at night, literacy. You know? yeah. So there was a much to, to admire. But I went into um, a couple of these circles in, in, uh, uh, in the city and 
and I felt that, and, and the materials had come from Cuba, and they were the farthest thing from Paulo Freire that you could imagine. They weren't like, you know, what are your questions, and how would you pursue those questions? They were much more get in line and, and follow the rules. So, so I don't think I don't think we can look and find a pure example of what we're talking about. But that doesn't mean we can't or a pure counter example. No, right? exactly. Yeah. But I think we can be aspirational, and I think the the point about Germany or or um, or fascist Italy is to remind us that you know what we call good education has to go way deeper than the question of whether we you know prepare good musicians or good uh, or, or good uh, scientists. But there's one other thing I'd like to trouble and for both of you really, and that is that this um, you talk about education for citizenship, and then I get a little worried because I live in a white nationalist country. You know, I get worried that we are foregrounding citizenship, and in the United States at least, the question of residents, <laughs> non-citizens, yeah. but who also are in our educational milieu and who also have both needs and, and also responsibilities. So I, I want to kind of always say education for citizenship and residents and community responsibility and world citizenship. I don't know how you think about that. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think that there's two approaches, right? There's citizen with a capital C, the legal sense of citizen, where we're talking about someone being a citizen or not, and that's about exclusion and inclusion, right? Um, and so one way to approach that, since we're obviously, you and I at least would be talking, all three of us would be talking about education for all the people who are right. residents here, not just right. C, citizens with a capital C. So one way is to avoid the word citizen, Another way, another approach would be to say that you know we need to recapture um, that the word citizen to to mean what it should mean, which is a member of the community. But I, I do think it's a, a bit of a, a bit of a dilemma. Well, I think I think that you're absolutely right, and I, I prefer that second approach. But I I almost feel like in every conversation we're in, then we should explain that because yeah. I'm in rooms all the time where there are residents who are wonderful, responsible, hardworking people, um, and, and yet they feel excluded when we say citizen, and they want to be included too. Yeah. So I think we have to... We get complacent because in the rarefied world of education yeah. and research, um, I think, uh, except for the people who are doing research on citizenship with a capital C, the teaching good citizenship means this broader, broader yeah. goal, but but you step outside of here, that's right, and for yeah. so many people it's really a, a problematic term. And I also think the, the other thing that I think is important in troubling these concepts is that, is that um, we, we need to think about what education is for. And you've been very good at this in your whole career of saying education for what? What kind of people do we want to see coming out? But we have to always keep in the front of our mind that we're living in a moment when education is being conceptualized and thrown at us as if it's a product to be bought and sold in the marketplace, like a laptop or a refrigerator. But you're talking about education as both a human right and a community responsibility. Quite different. So you're saying you have a human right to an education, um, and, and that education includes the, the full development of your human personality and your human commitment to, to the world. Um, so it's a, it's a different yeah. thing, but I think in a way, because of what we're up against, we have to say it explicitly. I think you're right. I, I also think about my background and your background. And um, like when I think about, you know, you didn't get uh, an awareness of the world or politicized through your K-12 education. And I and I, I got there in spite of it. Right. So I also wonder about. I mean, you know, what are the limits of what we can do about these issues in school? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of issues about <clears throat> our society and a lot of influences on kids that, of course, aren't school. Um, and in some ways, even when we're talking about taking a, a kind of critical stance towards the society around us, um, it's almost impossible for schools to take on that position in some sense, since schools are instruments of the, the states, right, at the bottom line. Well, you know, my, my brother, who was a, a legendary high school teacher at Berkeley High School, he would always say, over the years, he would always say, I'm 60% an agent of the state. 
and 40% a more, more or less a free agent. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use that 40%. I'm going to squeeze every drop of life out of the 40%. But I, I'm not kidding myself to think that I'm working in a situation where I don't take attendance, don't give tests, don't give... I'm in that world. But the idea that you either have to succumb to that world or be a complete revolutionary is kind of silly. So I think facing reality requires you to, to, to look at that. But think about how we got into education. What drew us to education? I know in Mark's case, he thought he'd become fabulously wealthy. And <laughs> power and money. Yeah, power and money. Yeah, so, power and money. Yeah. So, so that's one way to think about it. But I think, you know, it's interesting, the origin story, all of our origin stories are interesting. And I think your students' origin stories are interesting. But for me, it, it's really an interesting moment because I was arrested opposing the war in Vietnam in the early days of the American invasion and occupation, 1965. And I was put in county jail for trespassing. I had I'd been um, part of a group that had tried to shut down the Selective Service Office. And we were put in jail, and that's where my education began. You know, because you really learn things when you're kind of up against, when you're trying to push against reality. So I came out of jail. I met some people in jail. I was in for 10 days. I had met somebody whose wife had started a freedom school affiliated with the civil rights movement. So I went out of jail and into my first teaching job. I was 20 years old. And it captured me. I had no intention to become a teacher. But in my mind, the notion of social justice or racial justice or improving the world and education were linked. And I was fortunate in that regard because I never had to think of justice or, or you know, democracy as some kind of add-on to what I thought was going on right there. I mean, it was integrated. But, yeah. but, but what drew me was this notion that education sits on two pillars. One is enlightenment, learning, knowing more, and one is liberation. And if that's the pillars of education, then that's where I want to be. But I found myself in schools, and that's your larger point. So I was in an institution for which those pillars didn't really mean much. And I was in a certification mill and so on. So I think decoupling schools and education is part of what it means to become a teacher of purpose and of value. Yeah. Is to, is to not pretend either that education only takes place in schools or to feel that that the school is the instrument the, that you, you know, that has to be perfect or you can't do education. Yeah. Well, you know, in a really pragmatic way, I think that one of the best things you can do in schools is is have the conversation that we're having right now exactly. with students because I think the so students right. live the school system, right? So when you when you ask them to examine the world that they live in and teachers too, um, it's a way of getting at this this sort of um, critical stance uh, on, on the environment, and I think that extends to the, the broader society. Well, I think, like as you're mentioning, making linkages between the what happens in the classroom and what's happening in the community is important. But you're not getting away from the origin story. What's your origin story <laughs> to education? Yeah, well, I was thinking about that because, of course, Bill was um, very politically active. I mean, I think my family, you know, I grew up uh, in a family that, that first of all, um, both my parents had, you know, various levels of tragic experience with the Holocaust. My mother um, fled uh, Germany by herself on a kinder transport when she was 10 and never saw her parents again. And I uh, knew my father was more lucky. He moved to Portugal with his parents. Uh, but then when he was 15, came to the United States to study uh, and lost many relatives. And I, I think that that kind of background story to my family, although it was not a, a you know, constant topic of conversation or anything, uh, always gave me the sense that you have to, it's like the, what you said about Nazi Germany, you know, that you have to question what, what you're being taught. You have, to, you have to question the world as it's presented to you, even if I wouldn't have used those words to say it. Um, now then, I also spent many years, as Bill, as both of you know, in a, in a socialist youth movement, <laughs> and I think that that also um, gave me this, this, uh, this sense. But you know, one of the in most interesting times of my life was um, this youth organization was Hashemir Hatzair, it was a, a socialist Zionist youth organization 
fairly anti-religious roots, you know, very secular, but Zionist. They wanted people to move to Israel and move to Kibbutz. And in, in 1982, I was still involved with them, and the war in Lebanon broke out. And I think one of my most significant moments in my education was seeing that youth organization tear itself apart in a really good way because no one could get on board with this new Zionist agenda. And yet we were very identified with Israel and with cultural values and you know with, with the, the ideals that the you know that, that were, were there in parts of the, the country. And um, there were, you know, kids are very, very serious and there were overnight plenaries till four and five in the morning and are we going to march in the Israeli Day Parade anymore? Mm. And people would say, well, the Israeli Day Parade is where you come together even with the other people's differences to support Israel. And other people said, but if that's Israel, then I can't support it. Right? And it's not the outcome or the, the, it was the process of that, that, that somehow there was enough critical engagement in that youth organization and the education that we got that allowed people to turn the critical eye on the very organization that promoted that. And I, I think when you can do that, right, you've succeeded in, yeah. in something. In a funny way, it's, it's a similar story to what happened to the communist movement uh, when Stalin rose, you know, that, that people who had, who had the ideals of a egalitarian society that didn't go to war and, you know, um, so on, came hard against uh, a reality that good people could Good people divided on, but but in the end it tore itself apart for the yeah. same kind of reason. But you know what's interesting to me, listening to you and just thinking about Mark pushing forward on this question of, of origin stories. I think that what what it does, and I think it's good for our students, but I think that that what's useful also is then to ask yourself, well, given that this is your history, my history, your your history, your students' history. What are the commitments you could distill from that, that you bring with you into the classroom? And could you make those commitments explicit and make a sign that you put on your mirror um, <laughs> and so that when you wake up and get ready for heading off to the classroom, you check the six or eight or ten things that you explicitly said, I'm committed to this. And then you go to the school, remember we're decoupling school from education, you go to the school and you don't live up to those commitments or you violate a commitment. You know, my commitment, my starting commitment is a kind of radical sense of egalitarianism, a sense that I will treat no human being like an object. I will, I will see every one of my students as a three-dimensional creature. And it's nine in the morning, and I line them up, boys and girls, to the bathroom. What the hell is wrong with me? You know. And but but the reason I like the idea of having it distilled, written, made explicit for you is because the real world of teaching and the real world of schools will wear you down. And so having that on your mirror is a way to say, yes, I fell short. Yes, I failed in some of my highest ideals but I'm going to get up tomorrow and do better, and I'm going to try harder. You could look at the list five years into teaching or even a year into teaching and say, oh, that's when I was idealist, you know, and I was talking to Mark Spooner too much, and, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Or you could say, I, I'm living in an institution that doesn't support these values, but nonetheless, I will get up every morning and try harder to live up to them. I, 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 I mean, you... you have brought this out so well in so much of your writing, um, because you write as a as a teacher, and and it's the idea that yes, it's not that you start with ideals and then you realize those are unrealistic, right? right? Um, it's that uh, we now have new teachers going into a classroom thinking they're going to do everything differently, and then finding themselves standing at the front of the room, turning the light switch on and off, and mm -hmm. screaming and yelling, and right. you have this out-of-body experience, you know, thinking like, oh my god, who is that person? And it's really, that speaks to teacher education, right, where we have to let new teachers know that 
um, they're not in full control of all the forces at, right. at work on them. There's, uh, they're coming into school in mid motion, right? It's not a new, it's not a new tabula rasa. Uh, there's lots of things going on there already, but it also doesn't mean that we are powerless in that, that we work in the in-betweens of those spaces. We both, uh, you know, push back against some of the forces that, that are difficult. I mean, just the fact that you have, you have to do crowd control in a classroom. If you're going to be teaching 35, 40 kids, um, it's very difficult to remain in, you know, with the pedagogy that you always love. Sometimes you do have to line them up to go to the bathroom. Um, so how do you push? How do you push back on that and make space right. for other other but, ways? But then also, my brother's admonition that you you say explicitly to yourself and others, and and, and this becomes part of, part of the reality that everyone understands that I am sixty percent an agent of the state, or whatever. However, you want to break that. Yeah. But you being explicit about that matters because. Then you can forgive yourself, even as you critique yourself. Yeah. I mean, and I, the rhythm of staying with teaching does involve, I think, ending each day self-critical. I could have done better with this kid at this moment in this, in this corner of this room, and beginning each day forgiving yourself for being human, and um, for being on a path. It's not like there's an end point of being a great teacher. There's a process of becoming a teacher. In fact. My youngest son, I mean my middle son, Malik, who's uh, 14 years in a middle school classroom, and when my brother and I have been to visit him, I'll sometimes say to him, Malik, you're a great teacher. And he says, I'm not a great teacher. I'm a guy who shows up every morning and tries to do a better job. And to me, that is what it means to be a great, great teacher. Yeah. You know, we, we visited Cuba and Venezuela in this conversation, but we haven't uh, fully explored North America in the, the Canadian and American context of schools. So if we're 60 percent agents of the state, what does that look like? What, what's happening in our context here? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, when I first moved to Canada, um, one of the earliest studies I did was of the um, civics education in both countries, in the United States and, and in Canada. And one of the things we found was that um, Canada on paper in the, in the curriculum documents and in the um, rubrics for teaching uh, civics education has, has generally uh, a more progressive kind of curriculum that acknowledges um, people's power, the need to, uh, to teach critical thinking, the need to um, teach about power and authority. Uh, but then we did research in classrooms. And even though those sort of foundational documents are different. Um, what happens in the class, by the time it gets to the classroom, much of that difference falls away. So um, by the time it gets to the classroom, uh, there's a stifling of that kind of deep questioning in too many classrooms. And it doesn't look so different in the US um, than, in, than in Canada. And yeah, I've been interested in that. You know, I think the, the context in the US, and it's really the only context I know in any depth, is really um, a troubling, difficult context and also remarkably hopeful at the same time. So there's this dialectic of the worst of times and the best of times, which, you know, as Dickens explains, which means it's like all times. Um, well, we're seeing this, this you know, obviously uh, not great development in the political world, but at the same time we're seeing the pushback, right? That's my point, exactly. So. We've had four decades of what you might call corporate school reform, but we've had both political parties, the major media, including the New York Times, the New Yorker, National Public Radio, um, the big foundations, all of them, uh, uh, corporations, all of them, unanimous on, on an ideological approach which says education is a product. And those of us who believe that it's a human right and a community responsibility have been on the defensive and being pushed around. But it's not just the ideology that says education is a product. It's a set of practices that, that I think there are three main ones to identify. One is the destruction of any collective voice of teachers. No, no, no matter what you feel about this union or that union leadership or whatever, the collective voice of teachers is essential for the forward progress of education. But that's been under assault for 40 years. Collective voice of teachers is, 
attempted to be erased. Um, a second pillar of this corporate agenda is to reduce education to a single metric on a single test and to say that's an educated person uh, or that's, uh, you know, to sort you out on the hierarchy of winners and losers, the educated people have high test scores, the uneducated have low test scores. This is something that none of the corporate reformers would allow for their own children. And yet, you know, they find it very easy to say, well, this is a failing school because of test scores. Or this is an excellent school because of test scores. So that's the second pillar. And the third is the, the uh, privatizing of the public space, the taking over the public space and turning it into a private enterprise. These three things have been catastrophic for education. But as you point out, Joel, the pushback has been remarkable. And it, interestingly, in four decades of the big megaphone and all the resources, they haven't won, they certainly haven't posited a moral argument that has convinced very many people. So teachers, students, communities are pushing back. And what we're witnessing right now, today, is West Virginia teachers in a wildcat strike that it's, and frankly, you know, you say, oh, yeah, well, then it's a, it's a wildfire across the, across the right to work states, or what we call the right to work for less states. Um, meaning that collective bargaining and union rights are restricted in these states, and yet teachers have mobilized themselves and said, we're not gonna take it. But here's what's interesting about this pushback to me, is it is a labor conflict, but it's really a social movement masquerading as a labor conflict. In other words, you go to look at that West Virginia situation, it's parents and teachers on the picket line. It's kids walking out. And it's worth noting that, you know, you said earlier, you know, is this the beginning of a, there is no beginning. You, you were pointing out, you go into a school, you're in the middle of the model. Mm -hmm. It's not like it starts today. Yeah. So get over that idea. Yeah. You walk into something that's underway, you go into a going world. Well, with this teacher, these wildcats spreading across the country, this comes out of the Black Lives Matter moment, the undocumented and unafraid moment, the women's march moment. Mm -hmm. It comes out of upheaval. It comes out of fire from below. And then West Virginia happens, and the teachers in Oklahoma invite some of the West Virginia wildcatters out to address their teacher. So these things are spreading organically yeah. in the way they should. They spread, and also it's important, you know, the media focuses on, oh, Teachers are uh, striking because their salaries have been under attack and being lowered, you know, for decade after decade, which is all true. But they're missing, of course, that yes, teachers are fighting as they should for you know a living wage. Um, but that's hardly the main part of these strikes. They're striking about the working conditions that children's learning, which means it's teachers' collective voice, as you were saying, that that is right now the main voice on the side of children. What they're, what they're asking for is smaller class sizes and time to be able to prepare their classes and supplies and toilet paper for the bathrooms. And you know? arts programs. And, and arts programs and, and music very, programs. Yeah, right. It very much harkens back to the Chicago strike five years ago because yeah. by law, and they did all kinds of things in Illinois to restrict the Chicago Teachers Union, by law they could only negotiate wages and benefits. If you went to any of the rallies in downtown Chicago that week, the banners were, every school deserved the arts, do not close the libraries, and so on. They, that wasn't negotiable, but that's what the sign said, and that was also a parent-teacher alliance. So as we move into this kind of aggressive uh, attack on labor, which has been, you know, a conservative, you know, dream for a long, long time, now with our Supreme Court, with Gorsuch on the court, the whole country's going to become right to work, and that means that unions are going to be fatally weakened. And that's a horrible thing on one level. And in another way, what it means for folks like us is the architecture that has kind of, that has kind of uh, driven labor management um, relationships for 70 years is disappearing. So a new architecture will be built. And what we're seeing in West Virginia is so, and Chicago and Kentucky and so on is so hopeful because it's an architecture that says, okay, you're outlawing this and this and this. We're going to the community. And what you're seeing in West Virginia is you're seeing a fight for public education. And that's really what it is at bottom. And that's why 
I say it's a social movement as well as a labor conflict. It's yeah. really a, something bigger. And one of the movements that you didn't mention in the Black Lives Matter, Women's March, and so forth, is specifically an educational movement, which was the opt-out movement. And we're, we're seeing this confluence between these labor strikes, so-called labor strikes, but also parents are fed up with the narrowing Absolutely. of the curriculum. Parents don't like seeing their kids come home uh, in tears when they're seven years old because the teacher told them that the that the test is going to determine you know everything about their future or the teacher's future. Um, and parents, you know, over the last ten years, parents have really started to push back and say, "This is not the kind of education we want uh, for our kids," and uh, and and we have to take notice of that. And you know, you were mentioning before, Bill, about the you know the Democrats and the and the Republicans and the ways you know. Now, obviously, we're in a very extreme moment, but of course, these decades of Democrats and Republicans both being horrific on, ed on an educational agenda, pushing these testing, you know, pushing the narrowing of the curriculum, um, pushing militaristic kind of, of schooling, uh, and I think we're going to see that change now. I, I'm quite optimistic about that. Well, I, I'm not sure that I'm optimistic, but I'm, what I'm hopeful about is that um, you know the Democratic Party leadership establishment, when Trump was elected, they immediately said, we're the resistance. Hillary Clinton said, we're the resistance. Well, no. On every issue that matters, war and peace, finance, capitalism, um, you know, uh, housing policy, but in our world, an educational policy, yes, Betsy DeVos is a monster, but who <coughs> laid down the pavement for Betsy DeVos? It includes Arne Duncan, and it includes John King. So the idea that she's standing out there as the worst of the worst, she is. But Arnie Duncan also agreed that education is a product. And he created the framework for some of this. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that we there's a there's a great I have a great hopefulness about about resistance because I see it springing up in ways we didn't imagine. Back to West Virginia and these wildcat strikes, it's worth remembering that every revolution is impossible the day before it starts. And if you'd asked any of these people gathered here, all these educational scholars, did you see West Virginia coming? Nobody saw it coming. Nobody saw Rosa Parks coming. But the day after every revolution, it seems inevitable. And so it's that sense that we're in a moment when had things been gone along normally in this country, in the political sphere or a lot of things, we wouldn't be seeing this upheaval. Donald Trump represented a, a rupture, and it forced everybody to rethink a lot of things. And I think that's healthy. I, w I wouldn't wish Donald Trump on anyone, but yeah. having it, it, the fact that it happened and that people didn't roll over and lie down, but rather rose up in new, unpredictable ways, and, is very hard. To and the latest instantiation that the, the fact that the latest wave of this is kids. I mean, those Parkland kids and the and, and all the other kids across the country is amazing. I got to tell you though, you know, my many of my friends were did the kind of typical old person thing of saying, "Oh, the Parkland kids, they didn't have a demand." And I'm like, "Dude, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're in motion. They're learning." In Chicago, a thousand kids in a suburban school who walked out during the National Orca were put in detention, mm -hmm. and several people were wringing their hands. And I said. Detention, that's where the political education happens. Are you kidding? <laughs> a thousand kids who walked out for peace and an end to violence are punished, and they're sitting there in their hour of detention saying, This is how power looks at us. Yeah. This is how power treats us. Yeah. You know, and I think that's that's worth the, the price of admission to detention. You know, my friend Michael, who you know, yeah. um, is a teacher in a uh, well to do private school right. in, uh, in Manhattan. And, um, and of course, it, there, there's, the school has a fairly progressive faculty, many with PhDs, and, um, and, and they wanted to support the students in the walkout. Right. But they also wanted to teach the kids that, you know, protest doesn't come easy. I mean, right. you have to have skin in the game, right? You have to, and they had rules. Uh, and, and it did result in detention, for example, if you, if you leave school. So they wanted to figure out what the balance was here, because if, if the institution just flips over, you're, you're losing an, a, a, an educational moment, a teachable moment. So these kids did go to detention, 
but all the teachers who were interested in the protest came to detention too. Yes. And they spent the whole time talking about the history of protest and the cost of right. protest and that um, it doesn't come free, right? Yeah. You, you know, you, you, uh, you, there's a huge value in knowing you're doing the right thing at any given time, but there's also some cost. Is there a Canadian angle to all this? I know we talked to a lot of focusing on the yeah. movements and, and happenings in America. Well, well, Mark, you're so involved in, in grassroots politics in Canada. Um, and I, I was thinking when Bill was talking about the, the attacks on collective bargaining and on unions here, um, for sure we have a lot more public support for for collective organizing and, and union, although but we've seen these same things pop up, right? In Ontario, there was the attempt to strip teachers of uh, certain uh, types of collective bargaining rights, and we're seeing that in other provinces as well. But um, but I know, I mean, do you think that that's at risk, that public support for unions in general? I, I don't think so. I, like, so far, I think it's, it's been quite... Um, Accepted and, and a part of the Canadian fabric that yeah. uh, we, many of us belong in labor unions in the education sector, including our professors. Um, but but that same corporate agenda is at work in in Canada. And in fact, the Fraser Institute, for example, which does rankings of schools and pushes standardized testing, is um, partly funded by the Koch brothers. Mm -hmm. And you know, one might wonder why do the Koch brothers care about what what goes on in Canada? And they care because they want to. Uh, change the facts on the ground and the culture that that takes for granted uh, something like that you know unions are healthy and, you know, it's well and I think that the power is that we have a tangible example that Americans can point to hey look the, you know they, they are unionized there it does happen we can mm -hmm. we can do that in that way that if you get rid of that then there's not the like our healthcare system you know we can it actually happens and it's real and it can work yeah, and then, yeah but I wouldn't I, I wouldn't uh, Become complacent about any of it. No, no. And uh, and 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 you know one of the things that you, that you learn by just a glance at history is that first of all, power never means its withdrawals. It's a, it's not serious about its withdrawals. So imperialism never means I'm going to leave for sure or for real. It means I'll back up if I have to. And that's the same with you know labor rights. It's a the conflict between labor and and capital is abiding, and it will take different forms. But I see, I think we should all be nimble and agile and know what our core values are, mm -hmm. because the world that we live in is a temporary thing, and a new world is coming. And it's, it's not guaranteed that it'll be a better world. It could be a world of nuclear war. It could be a world of work camps and slavery. It could be a world of environmental collapse. It's very real, it's right in front of us. So I think that we have to say in our teaching, in our organizing, in our struggles, we have to say what we're fighting for in the here and now is the statewide awake, but, but we're fighting for more democracy, more peace, more justice, more transparency, without guarantees. There's no guarantee that, that, that what we see is what we're going to see. I, a simple example, I have talks with young people all the time about it. I understand the anxiety of parents about their kids' education because they're looking at a hostile job market. And the kids are anxious because they're looking at a space where jobs are disappearing. What, where, what, do you, what job, you know, the question, um, how soon is a robot coming for your job? And the answer is pretty soon. And, and I don't care what you do. If what you do is routine, and if we base it, if we base our sense of what society is going to look like on a jobs economy, I think we're we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I don't think our match. Is, I, I mean, Martin Luther King said this again and again that we are, you know, that our imaginative space, our sense of justice, has been well outstripped by kind of practical concerns about you know, techn technological fixes. But if you stop it for a minute and say, what will the world look like in 20 years? And frankly, I always get annoyed with, um, you know, foundations that want to prepare kids for the, the 21st for, century. Yeah, for, yeah. For, yeah. For, you never, know, never know what the 21st century yeah, means exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> now we're preparing kids for 2050, and I've got a two-year-old grandchild and a five-year-old grandchild. 
They have no idea what these kids are going to be looking at it. Think back 20 years. We have no idea either. But all I'm urging is that we not only not be complacent about what we've got, but that we rethink whether this framework is going to work at all 5, 10, 15 years from now. Well, the funny thing about this 21st century is that if it means anything, it seems to mean like some kind of information economy. and. and and so, and it seems to result in certain sectors for push a push for a back to basics curriculum where you teach a lot of facts, okay. which is the, the most odd thing because we all carry around yeah. these these devices in our pockets. We can you know get any fact we want in, in five seconds. So one thing we clearly do not need is more facts. We have like a, a, we're inundated with facts. We need to teach the skills of how kids can tell well, what, what facts to pay attention to. Right. And there's we that, and there's we need we need to foreground the dispositions. Of creativity and imagination, you know, we were talking the other day about about how good we are at critiquing the system, and how we have not kept up with being able to imagine and posit possibilities for a different system. And if we can't exercise our radical imaginations or our social imaginations, then I think we're in real trouble because folks like us who want to see a robust public square. We get kind of trapped if all we do is critique, because frankly, that our critique also goes into the giant sewer of critique that says we don't need public schools, and we disagree with that. So let's let's always remind ourselves that critique and possibility have to go together. So critique alone is an incomplete act. It is, and, 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 I, and I think and I think we again and again we have to learn to think. Um, dialectically, by which I mean in contradiction. We have to keep thinking about the contradictions we're facing, not trying to resolve them, but trying to swim through them in a way that makes us smarter and more, as I say, agile, but also more aware of what's in front of us. And, and I think one of the ways to do that on the ground is to emphasize the human relationship nature of teaching and learning, um, which is by definition local. Right. And I think one of the things that there's lots of critiques of the high stakes testing and the standardized curriculum. Um, one that sometimes get lost gets lost is, is of course that that standards and standardization it means making everything the same. It's kind of the opposite of imagination. And to nurture imagination, I think we have to make lots of things different. Right? Yeah. We have to root it in a local context um, where people can work with the, the, the facts on the ground around them um, and come up with possibilities for change or using that local Absolutely. content. But, but I, I want to go back to standard standardization because I don't see those as the same thing. And, and I think you were making a distinction between them. Absolutely. Well, I mean, so yeah. I mean everyone has standards, right? Well, you have to have standards. <laughs> and we should be in our schools, in our classrooms, we should be discussing standards. We should be talking about what's a standard behavior in this fifth grade, I think that's hugely useful. I think it's the same with the, same. I think it's the same with the word accountability. Absolutely, I mean, there's nothing wrong. With, like yes. people are accountable. We're accountable to each other. We're accountable to the kids, to the parents. Mm -hmm. um, but standardization is the problem. Well, standardization is the problem, and with accountability, which sounds pretty good. If what it means is we're going to hold you responsible for this mm -hmm. test score, and we're not going to hold the foundation or the government responsible for giving you a decent classroom. Yeah. You know, that's that's where it falls apart. But you said something earlier I want to return to for just a moment, because uh, the, the way you said it was quite good, and, the, and this notion that, that when teachers are pushing toward something like smaller classes, and they're characterized as lazy, incompetent, and self-dealing, yeah. we need to challenge that. We need to say very clearly that good working Conditions are good teaching conditions. Good teaching conditions are good learning conditions, and you can't get good working conditions without the collective voice of teachers being at the school at, at the at the table. Not just teachers, not teachers alone, but I often think in Chicago, if we were developing standards for fighting a fire in a in a high rise, you would certainly want firefighters at the table. You wouldn't want just aldermen. <laughs> You know, in Chicago particularly, but you know the idea that you could make standards for bringing equipment and personnel into a burning building without folks who'd actually fought a fire. It was only a, 
It was only the budget people and the political people. I mean, ridiculous. And yet people talk about this with schools all the time. My brother used a phrase the other day that was so great. We were talking in front of, uh, at a bookstore, and I think he'd heard this, but, but I'm crediting him with making it up. Have you heard of mansplaining? You know, men explain things to me. He used the word edusplaining. <laughs> and that, and you, know, you say to somebody, I'm a teacher, and immediately say, oh, I know, you know, schools ought to do right. it. But it's <laughs> almost the reverse of mansplaining. It's yeah. like it's, it's explaining to educators. Well, right? but that's what yeah. mansplaining is. It's men explaining things to women. To women, right. Yeah, right. To, right. That women yeah. already know, but yeah. the man knows it better. Well, right. this is edusplaining. So every yeah. everybody and their uncle, you know, you say, I'm a professor of education. I say, Let me tell you, Mark, yeah. what yeah. you want to do. Okay, thank you. But, you know, I want to say one other thing. Bill, about the, the challenges of this, because you said, yeah, of course, teachers' voices should be represented, right? And in some ways, the Common Core was an effort to do that, and they did include a lot of teachers' voices, and a lot of our friends support Absolutely. the Common Core. And um, and they support it for some good reasons, because Absolutely. it really did include teachers' voices, and it's better than any other so-called standards that right. have come before, and yet, it still lends itself to this homogenization right of teaching and learning, and it still lends itself to um, providing a way to attack teachers based on circumstances that are not fully under their control. And so, yeah, we have to we have to be careful um, about, we always have to have this idea of standardization at the, at the forefront of the problems. With it. Absolutely. It reminds me of another thing, which, and you know, the use of language is so important, but, but I think that anything that proposes to help classrooms or schools that doesn't look at the structures of economics and history and political, you know, um, control and so on. Anything that that asks to fix the kids without fixing the structure is always on the wrong track. So one of the popular things now that drives me up a tree. I was talking to some friends about it here this weekend. Is this notion of grit? I don't know if you've been infected by this, but it's sweeping the, yeah. it's a catchphrase. So what the kids need, and we can test for it, <laughs> is they need grit. And it's the lack of grit that makes them fail. It's not poverty, it's not racism, it's not, you know, and so on. It's not a crappy, broken down school with a yeah. temporary teacher force. It's the lack of grit. And the thing it's like telling so, hungry people that they need stamina. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Gloria Lanson Billings, who's a friend of ours and a wonderful educational researcher, she has a blog that everyone should look at called Black and Smart. And uh, Gloria, when the grit thing was first sweeping the nation, she said, grit. Black people have nothing but grit. What we lack is structural fairness and money. I mean, you know, we got the grit. Um, but I think that's one. But I, but I think there's another example of it. And anything, as I say, anything that locates the problem inside the kids, mm -hmm. or inside the families, or inside, you know, that kind of sense of of a deficit in you, that doesn't address the question of structures and money and all the rest, is false. But I think there's another problem, which is in our language in America, the word racism means two distinct things. It means bigoted, backward stupidity, and it means structures of oppression based on color. Mm. And so we have in a lots of, and the reason that white folks can sit around and say, I'm not a racist, is what they mean is the first definition. I'm not a bigoted, backward, ignorant slob. Good for you. Um, congratulations, right? <laughs> um, not much of an accomplishment, but all right. But if you're willing to live in a society that structures success and failure based on color, and it goes back centuries, mm -hmm. then to say I'm not a racist kind of misses the point. So we see again and again in Chicago, the mayor never uses the N-word, never would. He's not that kind of bigot. He closes 52 schools in black and brown neighborhoods, and then proposes $95 million to build a police academy. That's not only racist, it's a recipe for social suicide. So, which is the racism? In some ways, that second kind of racism is is more damaging than the first. And it's also the father of the second, of the first. In other words, the idea that people have that bigotry somehow leads to inequality gets it right backwards. I mean, 
it's really the, stru the structures of inequality, starting with slavery. I mean, no one literally thought these people are inferior. They thought to create the bigotry to justify the, the financial enterprise. So we have to get it straight only because we spend too much energy fighting against stuff that is pretty superficial and that gets regenerated because of the real problem. So my bigger point is, if you if you are going to a, to offer a solution to some of the problems we face in education, and you leave out the structures, mm -hmm. you're missing the whole point. Well, it may, it, 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 may, it reminds me of that old saying: if you're not part of the solution, yeah. you're part of the problem. In the sense right. that it's not enough to just be passive and not be part of the problem, right? You have you do have to be participating right. in, in taking apart and rebuilding these, <clears throat> these systems of power. You know, one of the things you guys mentioned, I think Mark, you mentioned it, and Joel, you spoke to it, that I'd like to return to is this notion of, um, of um, kind of what, what, what we can do in classrooms, um, what, we, what we can offer. Um, we talked about commitments, but, but I think that, that um, what I'm thinking is that we need to talk in schools with kids about the dilemmas and problems that we face. You know, in other words, as educators, yes, as be transparent in your classroom. And really, some of the best teaching I've ever seen is when teachers give the kids the problem. So the problem is, I'm having a, you know, I, I, there are too many of you and too few supplies and too, you know, and too little time. And if you have that as your personal problem, that is driving you crazy day in and day out and making your partner unhappy because you're constantly sh kvetching about it. You know, why not give it to the kids? Why not say to the kids? And I remember many examples, but I remember Ellie Wigginton hating the kids he was teaching in, in a rural Georgia. And one day saying to the kids, um, this isn't working. You know, I hate this classroom. This is horrible. And what should we do about it? And that unleashed a year of conversation with the kids. I think I, I was saying before about, you know, I was giving an example of the fifth grade. And what, what I was reminded of is that one of my sons, Malik, had a fifth grade teacher who was absolutely inspired. And th these are all 10 year olds, right? Fifth grade. And the kids come into the class and they see all this interesting, there's a loom and there's a, a aquarium and there's computers and, and he gathers them on the floor um, and he said and he talks about the class and what they're going to do and then he says um, we have three rules in this classroom and all their antenna go up because they're little ethnographers trying to figure out where's the blow going to come from and he says we have three rules rule number one is you can't wear hats all the ten year old boys are like wow <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Wilson is so Great. Rule number two is you can chew milk. But these are two obsessions in the school <laughs> that you can't do. So suddenly he's a revolutionary, and if you know anything about revolution, the revolutionaries always have to be at a higher level of behavior than the rest of the population because they're getting away with something. Um, they're underground. So he says, and rule number three is this is a learning environment. You have to respect one another and one another's work. And when we have a problem with rule number three, We'll have a meeting. Now, what's he done? He's created the standard that they're going to refer to all year long, and they're going to come back to it again and again and again. Because what what he's basically saying, you were talking about crowd control, but what Wilson is saying is that we have this standard, and the curriculum that I'm teaching is learning to live together. We're learning to live together, and that's a lifetime problem. That's not a problem getting you to shut up so I can cram some more stuff in your head, we are going to learn to live together. And that's as salient in a graduate class as it is in a kindergarten class. You have graduate students, some talk too much, some don't talk enough. We have to learn to live together. You know, So I think that's a brilliant example of giving the problem to the students with a sense of what our standard is, but then We'll work it out. I think about how, how different that is than the um, very popular and common 
activity in, a, in an elementary school, which is to have the kids and you say, let's come up with the classroom rules yeah, together. That always drives me right? nuts. And then you, so they're coming up with it from scratch, but if you go travel across North America and look at 500 classrooms, you know, 10 of the rule, there's 10 rules in every classroom. Eight of them are exactly the same. No and running, no shouting. No running, no shouting. Listen, listen to others when they're talking. Right. Don't talk, you know. Um, and then there's always a crazy one because kids are crazy, right. like don't pull Bill's hair or something. Yeah, I'm um, always worried that somebody's going to say, if you steal something, cut their hands off. You know? Right, oh, no. exactly. Uh, it's democratic, but not that. Right. But, but the, what, what your example brings up is, is how do you get kids to think about um, their environment and the choices that they have about exactly. their environment. Um, you don't get it by asking them to come up with the rules because that just reproduces the rules they already know. Exactly. Um, so how do you create the space to have kids think about the fact that these rules are not, they're not the Bible, right? They're not written in stone. We, these, are, these are things we've, we've made choices about. Um, and there are other ways to think about them. what and what might they be. Right? I mean, I think what you're also doing with the Wilson approach is you're underlining, I think in some ways, the most important lesson I want kids to know, which is you have agency. You are an agent of your own life. You are a member of this community and you're an agent within it. And if, if your, your point about coming up with the rules, that's the progressive way, but there's a school, a school in Chicago visiting the lunchroom and there are 10 rules posted, carved in wood, you know, so they're really rules that are really rigid. And <laughs> no, they're not carved in stone, they're just carved in wood. Exactly, but rule number one is no running, rule number two is no throwing food, rule number three is no fort fights. And you think, oh shit, what did somebody do five years ago to put rule number three on yeah, the yeah. board, you know? But, but the wonderful thing about that is that when I got to Chicago 30 years ago, the, the handbook of rules was this thick. It's not this thick. Oh. And why is that? Because the adolescent imagination can outstrip whatever you write down. <laughs> so write it down, and they, hey, that gives me a good idea. Right. <laughs> How about this? Right. So, so all of those are teaching yeah. um, this sort of social control or behavior when, when what we want to be teaching is how do we regard one another as, exactly. as human beings. Exactly. And so the Wilson approach not only foregrounds agency and how do we regard one another, yeah. but it gives you a sense that this is a lifelong project. It's not, it's not rules and consequences. It's figuring out how to live together. Yeah. And that's, a, that's in your kind of notion of what it means to be a citizen, what kind of citizen do we want. Yeah. That's a core yeah. piece of it. You know? Remember that book, um, uh, Don't Eat the Daisies? I don't. It was a, a children's book, and, and it was exactly about the parents laying out all these rules. Um, but then the, the kids go out and they get to the garden and they eat the daisies. And the, the parents say, what are you doing? And they, and they say, well, that wasn't one of the rules that we weren't allowed to eat the daisies, right? So you can't, you can't come, you, it's, a, it's a ridiculous game. Even yeah. if it's for social control, you can't come up with all the things you can't That's why do. The rule keeps growing. That's exactly. why it keeps getting bigger. Exactly, yeah. So a question for both of you. What what would you like to close on? Oh, I, before we yeah. close, I gotta just tell you this one thing. You know, one of we all have a million failures and three three interesting experiments when we're teaching. And one of the things I did one of my earlier years of teaching um, was we had these these two days where the teachers were supposed to set up their classrooms, right, and also meet in curricular groups and everything. And so the teachers were were um, uh, you know moving the furniture around, and some were putting them in groups and some were putting them in rows and putting art on the wall. And um, this one other teacher and I decided we would put all our furniture uh, in, a, in this locked closet and, um, and we left them there. And the room was blank. And, but we did bring in lots of posters and supplies and all kinds of things, but those were also in the closet. And when the kids came in, they were, you know, they'd seen all these other classrooms that were all set up. And, uh, and like my kids, you know, said, what, what happened? You know, where were you when they were setting up the classroom? Yeah. I said, you know what, I, I wasn't able to be here. And not only that, all, everything was locked in the cabinet and I couldn't get the key. <laughs> and, uh, but now I have it. So, you know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna hang out a little and set up the classroom. And, you know, so we started taking things out and I said, well, wait a minute, what, you know, how, how are we going to set it up? And this started a nice. conversation, and we met with the kids from this other class who didn't have furniture, and they, they created um, an arrangement that, that they thought 
you know, was a good one for the classroom, and it was a really interesting know, idea. But that's an example of what I, that's a brilliant example of what I was saying before about being transparent. What is the work of a teacher? And part of the work of a teacher is setting up. So how do we give the work of a teacher to our co-teachers? And, you know, I, I, as an early childhood teacher for many years, I used to try to figure out how do we do things like collect lunch money, take attendance, and so on, that isn't a bureaucratic thing that I do, but is an activity that we do through the environment. And I'm a big believer in setting an environment that tells people what to do. I remember when my kids were teenagers, my own kids, and they would come home and throw their coats on the couch, and it used to drive my partner nuts. And we made one little environmental shift, which is we put a coat tree by the front door, and then they can do that. But, but you know, the environment means so much, and let them... Because they weren't going to go put it in a closet. Yeah, but exactly. They, they, but they could, but they could they throw it on the right, That's right, fine. You know, right. I, I just think, I think if we gave the work to the kids, and if we were honest with kids, if we were more honest and more, and, and didn't keep our adult talk to ourselves, I mean, if we can sit, you know, in Chicago, we can sit and talk to ourselves and say, it's really outrageous how the system is treating black kids in this system. But we'd never say that to the kids. Why not? <laughs> Why not be honest yeah. with what's going on and let them help us come up with solutions? Another thing you said that I think is worth repeating is that you, know, you said we fail more than we succeed. That's true when you're building a social movement. It's true, true when you're trying to fight for peace or justice. We fail much more than we succeed. And we have to get used to kind of get kind of the idea that our successes are marvelous and valuable, but we can learn from our failures and not see them as you know to kind of be all in it. But the failures are part of the success, well, right? I mean, they're on their way. To, and and I'm, I'm a huge fan of this notion of the queer art of failure, which which is the basic idea being that if everything is bumping along predictably in your relationship in your political world, in your professional life, you don't have to question it. But as soon as you fail, as soon as a bump comes in the road, you have to question everything. That can be a good thing. Which also gives us the energy for the long haul. Like I, I've always liked the thing that Vaclav Havel said about hope. Yeah. He said hope um, isn't the certainty that something's going to turn out the way you want it to. It's the knowledge that you're doing the right thing, yeah. right? And, and being part of the right, the right direction. And I, and I think that that's true. And that you know what you said before, Bill, about um, the the you know, not fitting the, the kids yeah. to the school, but fitting the school to the kids. We have the most the most egregious example of not doing that right now is the um, outrageous overprescription of ADD and, and well, other yeah. and other yes. medications. Right? I mean, if we have a situation where a majority of kids are not normal and can't fit into the the structure, obviously there's clearly something wrong with the structure. Right. right? Yeah. And Joel and I are you know. I always tell my students, you know, if you don't read The Onion, then you don't know what's happening in the world. You, know, you need satire and comedy central and so on. So, we, you and I have talked about this, but all the ADHD and, and what's the one that drives you crazy? ODD, ODD Oppositional ODD, Defiance Disorder. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But the one I like is from The Onion, and it's YTV. Do you remember this one? Uh, if the story, the headline is... Uh, uh, 100,000 American children suffering from YTD, and that's youthful tendency disorder. And, um, and, and they interview a fictional mom who says, we were devastated to learn that our daughter had YTD, but relieved to know it wasn't our fault, that it's a condition. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, well, you know that it's this teacher from Oregon, Norm Diamond, who yeah. coined this disease, the, the CAD which is Compliance Acquiescence Disorder, uh, and he said it's, it's an epidemic that uh, kids are just agreeing and yeah. doing everything they're told, they're not questioning what is it again? Complete. Compliance Acquiescence Disorder, okay. CAD, right? Yeah. I mean, I think if we did an inventory for CAD, we'd, we'd find a, a, an epidemic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. What, what, uh, what would you like to end on? How do you want to close well, out? I just, one other thought that I, that I kept rolling around is that I mean, we're talking to each other and we're, we're developing ideas, but we're also talking to people who want to be teachers. And I said, as we began, that I thought that a good exercise is to push yourself to saying, what are your commitments? What are you bringing with you 
to the classroom that you're going to try to live up to. And I think there's another kind of related thing, which is, and, and for me, as I said, seeing the student as a three-dimensional creature is a huge um, commitment that I want to live up to. Seeing freedom and liberation as my goal is something I want to live up to. I want to notice that every, every kid is an unruly spark of meaning-making energy. Every kid is the one and only who will ever walk the earth. And paradoxically, every kid is one of the many. Mm -hmm. And how you do that in a classroom is complicated because on the one hand, there will never be another human being just like you. On the other hand, you share with every other human being uh, the experience of being born, of suffering, of dying. I mean, we, we, we share a human culture. So somehow putting yourself in that dialectic is important. But there's a second thing, which is I think besides knowing what commitments you're bringing, you should know what your key lessons are that you intend to teach, and it's related to commitment. So for me, I, I want to always teach the lesson that you have a right to be here, wherever you are. And, and that means an illegal immigrant, that means a disabled kid, that means a trans kid. You have a right to be here. You have a right to live your life and love your life. And you, have, you, have, you need no one's permission to interrogate the world. You can interrogate the world without anyone telling you that's okay. So those are lessons that I want my kids to feel emanating off of me um, in a thousand ways. Yeah. How about you, Joel? Um, you know, I've been thinking about this, this thing. My, my wife is an um, uh, English professor, and she does a lot of literary theory. And through her, I've started to read some of some of the stuff that I never would have touched with a 10-foot pole. And, uh, and, and you can understand it. Yes, yeah, so, well, no, I, I get her help, too. But, She's um, translated. Right? But, um, one of the theorists is Amanda Anderson, and, and she uh, said several times that the, she thought that the purpose of literary criticism um, was to question, the, to think about how we should live, right? Uh, when you read novels, when you read narratives, how we should live. And I, I really thought that that is a wonderful uh, sort of guiding goal for education, is getting uh, kids to think about how we should live, to, to first of all know that how we are living isn't the only way to live. Right. Um, and that one of their jobs in life, and this brings us back to the beginning of the conversation, when you're, you know, Thomas Jefferson said, if the people are not well educated enough to govern their own affairs, then the power is not to take it away from them and give it to a king, it's to educate them. And that was one of the founding purposes of public education in, in the United States. Um, and if, if that's the case, if the people are to govern our own affairs, then we need to think about this question, how we should live. I love that question. And, you know, it also brings to my mind that, you know, in a contradiction in schools, you know, the, to, be, to be oppressed is to be sorted, judged, you know, ranked, uh, lined up, uh, 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 labeled. That that's to be oppressed. To be free is to throw that off. Mm -hmm. And since we start from the understanding or the belief, we do, you and I do, three of us do, from an understanding that, that, that every human being is of incalculable value. And what power does is they allow to themselves a sense of culture, identity, history, agency. But the rest of us can be written off by our statistical profiles, age, gender, zip code. We have to resist that. And part of resisting that is saying, this is where we are. This is the world as such. But how shall we live? What, what, what standing right next to the world as such is a possible world. If we can't see that possible world, we can't actually act in a moral way. And once we see that possible world, What's my role going to be exactly. in, in bringing that? What's my responsibility? What's my responsibility? Yeah. Well, I'd like to end by thanking you, Dr. Joel Westheimer, and you, Dr. Bill Ayers, for taking the time out of uh, busy AERA schedules and thanks, yeah. filming this. So uh, thank you. Well, thanks for putting this together. Yeah, thanks so much, Martin, for everything you do. All right.